Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our STI Forum site event on managing the risks of lack of governance around solar radiation modification. This uh, site event is organized by the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative, C2G, and the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLEC. My name is Alia Hassan, and I'm an outreach officer for the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative. Uh, we will, um, I'm being reminded that my video is not turned on. Thank you for that. <laughs> There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, our side event today aims to provide participants with an understanding of solar radiation modification and the gaps around its governance. We'll be examining uh, what we do and don't know about solar radiation modification, uh, its potential risks and benefits, and how these compare with the risks and benefits of use or non-use of solar radiation modification. We'll be looking at why gaps in current international governments uh, around the question of use or non-use of solar radiation modification poses risks in itself, and also uh, explore why and how strengthening the capacity and inclusion of youth and Global South researchers is essential to inform decision making uh, around managing the risks from overshoot. Uh, so this event will be divided in two sections. We'll start with some opening remarks by C2G, uh, followed by uh, presentations from the IPCC, Perspective Climate Research, a youth representative from Bangladesh and the University of Cape Town. And then we'll turn to our speakers. Um, sorry, and then we'll move to the Q&A section of this event. So please formulate your questions as you listen to the presentations. We'll have an opportunity to answer your questions uh, in the second portion of the event. Um, I'd like to uh, now turn to um, our Deputy Executive Director, Kai Uwe Barani Schmidt, who will be giving some opening remarks on behalf of Janos Pastor, our Executive Director, who at the last minute was unable to uh, join us uh, for this event. Uh, Kai, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alia, for introducing the session. I will share some thoughts up front, and our co-host, Mr. Santiago Lorenzo from uh, ECLAC, will share some closing remarks. Thank you. Let me start uh, by thanking also the organizers for accepting this event into the program, which is not evident. A warm welcome to the four panelists whom Alia will introduce later, as she said. And thanks to all of you for joining this event and taking time for this issue. Um, C2G is an initiative that launched in 2017 to seek to catalyze effective governance around carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation modification. For C2G and IPCC, governance is not limited to government. It involves public and private actors interacting through structures, processes, and actions to address societal goals. At the end of this year, we reach the end of C2G, a date chosen in relation to the release of the sixth assessment report of IPCC and the UNFCC global stock take under the Paris Agreement. One last point on C2G. The initiative is impartial as to the outcome of governance impartial whether or not a technology is to be used or not to be used. That is for these governance processes to um, find out. Now, solar radiation modification, that's what we are focusing on on this event, and specifically stratospheric aerosol ejection, involves reflecting sunlight back into space so that Earth warms less. This can happen at many levels, at ground level, by uh, painting roofs and streets white, changing color of landscapes, brightening clouds, marine clouds, for example, injecting small um, particles into the stratosphere, um, and even placing mirrors in space. Sounds crazy, risky, a diversion, humans at work, a potential emergency measure. So why the need for governance? The IPCC's most recent report has warned that the world is not on track to reach the pathways that could enable us to hold the increase to well below two degrees. The good news, we do see a lot of movement around climate action and enabling policy environments. We see change both small and big, and that should encourage all of us to keep moving and changing from walking to sprinting to overcome all the current remaining barriers and achieve the transformation IPCC is clear needs to occur in unprecedented ways to reach the Paris goals. The report also finds that even in those pathways that still have a chance of 50% to deliver 1.5 at the end of the century, it is now more likely than not that global warming will temporarily exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius, an overshoot, as they call it. These are the pathways with the most rapid, timely, and deep emission reductions, as well as large carbon dioxide removals. Just to make it very clear, the amount and length of such an overshoot is solely determined by the speed by which global climate action happens. 
Yet now, even when we manage to do that, there is a higher likelihood than not that for a longer period of time, the 1.5 goal will be exceeded. The enhanced likelihood of an overshoot, even in the lowest pathways, poses serious risks for both humanity and the ecosystems we depend on for survival, threatening the achievement of sustainable development goals. IPCC finds that adaptation has its limits. IPCC also is very clear that every small fraction of warming matters. IPCC also finds that the potential impacts of each change are bigger than previously assessed. And I'm not trying to take away um, the, the sound and the, the, the points of, of Thelma later, but let me continue. In such a context, there are gro growing calls for research on additional emergency options, such as solar radiation modification, to understand if it can keep global temperatures rise in check over an overshoot period to avoid the potential impacts by not creating more problems. It is important to note that there are a variety of views on this. For example, those I just referred to. There are those that call for a stop of any further research on SRM to ban SRM and to do so by any international agreement, as well as those that decide to take action and create a commercial endeavor around injecting aerosols into the stratosphere thereby challenging the current science and adequacy of government contexts, as recent articles in the news have shown. All these views are there, they are valid. And these views, however, and in particular the last one, illustrate some of the key governance challenges around SRM. In its last report, the IPCC finds that the lack for formal and robust governance frameworks represents a risk in itself. As one a UN actor contributing to the UN discussion, UNEP released a few weeks ago an independent um, report, expert group review of SRM called One Atmosphere. It confirms that the only pathway to 1.5 are the transformative actions mentioned earlier, and that at best, at best, SRM could maybe have a potential of a temporary measure. Finds further that at this stage, we do not know enough to conclude the use or non-use of SRM in the event of an overshoot that an international global review process and engagement process is needed to fill the gaps in knowledge and understanding, that a fora is needed that brings together those actors that have to be part of the process, noting that the UN could be such a place. Let me mention that um, the high-level advisory board under the Summit for the Future process just included the same idea of a fora and its input to that process. I, I hope these remarks help setting the scene for us to learn more from the panelists on various dimensions on the issue. And let me conclude by noting that whether one is for, against, or unsure about SRM, comprehensive international governance is urgently needed. Thank you very much. Over to you, Alia. Thanks, Kai. <laughs> so we'll now move on to the presentations and we'll start with Thelma Krug, who is the vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. She was also the co-chair of the IPCC Task Force on National Greenhouse Gas Inventories and a former researcher at the Earth Observation Coordination at the National Institute for Space Research in Brazil. She held various positions in the Brazilian government, including uh, Deputy National Secretary of Policies and Programs of Science and Technology at the Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation and Communications, National Secretary on Climate Change and Environmental Quality of the Ministry of Environment, and Director of Policies to Combat Deforestation at the Ministry of Environment as well. Talma will be sharing uh, some of the key messages from the latest um, IPCC uh, assessment report on the risk from temporary overshoot and the lack of the risk from the lack of formal and robust SRM governance. So Telma, here hey. is on camera. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm here. Yes, yeah. so thank you very much, Elia, and also thanks, uh, Kai. Uh, for already setting the scene, which I hope I will uh, enlarge. So good day to all participants of this forum. And let me first uh, thank the organizers for the invitation to participate in this event and also, you know, help set the scene for the presentations that will follow. I will address the risks from a temporary overshoot and from the lack of formal and robust SRM, solar radiation modification, based on the findings in the reports of the IPCC during this cycle. So I would like to start this talk with a brief overview of overshoot and associated risks, and we will start by providing the IPCC definition of temperature overshoot as a temporary exceedance of a specified level of global warming, say 1.5 degrees Celsius, 
that then returns to that level or below that level before the end of a specified period of time, say the end of the century. So temperature of a overshoot substantially increases the risk of release to the atmosphere of carbon stored in the biosphere due to increased wildfires, tree mortality, insect and pest outbreaks, peatland drying, drying and permafrost thaw. There are several different emission pathways that limit global warming to the long-term temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. And this slide shows uh, on the left, uh, this slide comes from the special report on uh, global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius of the IPCC in, 2000, in 2018, and shows the assessed pathways that limit global warming. Now, it's the previous one, Ilian. Um, that shows the, the assessed pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 by the end of the century. And you can see that some are within the envelope uh, depicted here in blue, which are uh, emission pathways with no overshoot, and the ones that you see outside shown in gray uh, are those uh, pathways that lead to 1.5, but are characterized by an exceedance of temperature returning to 1.5 by the end of the century. So uh, the, the higher and the longer in terms of duration the overshoot goes, the more challenging it is to return to the, the, to the desired level uh, of temperature increase. Next one. So the report of the IPCC Working Group 1 introduced five illustrative scenarios, emission scenarios, uh, that you see in the left side of this slide and that covered the range of possible future development of anthropogenic drivers of climate change that were found in the literature. They start in 2015 and include scenarios with high and very high emissions, the red ones that you see on the top, a scenario with intermediate emissions shown in yellow, and scenarios with low and very low uh, emissions which are shown in blue, in blue at the bottom. On the right hand side, uh, you can see the best estimate of the change in global surface temperature uh, in the long term, we, which is 2081 to 2100 relative to pre industrial times, indicating that for the intermediate scenario, the one that you can see in the yellow bars, the best estimate at that period of time is 2.8 degrees Celsius, with CO2 being the largest contributor to uh, in our emission scenarios. The report of the working group one indicates that the global warming is projected to reach or exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius in the near term, 2021 to 2040, even for the very low greenhouse gas emission scenarios that are, not, that are introduced, meaning that some overshoot is likely. Note that for the very low in low emission scenarios, again, the blue lines at the bottom, negative emissions will be necessary after 2050 for the 1.5 and around 2070 for the two degrees Celsius, which you can see these negative emissions because you go below the line of the zero carbon dioxide emissions. The next one, many changes in the climate system become larger in direct relation to increasing global warming. It is very likely that heavy precipitation events will intensify and become more frequent in most regions, mid-latitude and semi-arid regions in the South American monsoon region are projected to see the highest increase in the temperature of the hottest days at about 1.5 to two times the rate of global warming. And the Arctic is likely to be practically See, uh, 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 sea ice free in September at least once before 2050 under the five illustrative scenarios that I showed. The report of the IPCC Working Group 2 released in March 22 assessed that if global warming transi transiently exceeds or temporarily exceeds 1.5 degrees Celsius, then many human and natural systems will face additional severe risks compared to remaining below 1.5. Depending on the magnitude and duration of the overshoot, some impacts will cause the release 
of additional greenhouse gases, and some will be irreversible, even if global warming is reduced. You can leave it uh, here. Yes. So the report, yeah, we can move. Yeah. So the report of working group two includes examples of regional key risks that I'm not going to go in detail because of the time, but based on the magnitude of adverse consequences, such as the perversiveness of the consequences, the degree of change, irreversibility of consequences, and other factors. Additional warming, for instance, above 1.5 during an overshoot period this century, will result in irreversible impacts on certain ecosystems with low resilience, such as polar, mountain, and coastal ecosystems impacted by ice sheet, glacier melt, or by accelerating and higher committed sea level rise. The next one, solar radiation management does not stop atmospheric CO2 concentrations from increasing, and is only supported in the literature as a supplement to deep mitigation, for instance, overshoot scenarios. The approaches have the potential to offset warming and reduce some of the global risks of climate change related to temperature rise, sea ice loss, and frequency of extreme st storms and heat waves in some regions, but large uncertainties and knowledge gaps exist in relation to technological maturity, physical understanding, potential impacts and challenges of governance that may constrain the ability to implement SRM in the near future. One of the pieces of literature that has been assessed by the IPCC indicated that the use of SRM would create its own risks and would only make any sense in a world experience or expecting severe climate change impacts. And as such, consideration of SRM takes place in a risk-risk context, whereby the risks of application are judged against the risks from climate change without SRM. So considering the impacts of SRM in isolation can be misleading as SRM's sole raison d'etre reason to be is the reduction or avoidance of climate impacts stemming from elevated greenhouse gas concentrations. And to be relevant assessment of SRM needs to enhance our understanding of potential effects across a multitude of socially relevant parameters rather than a single one. And chapter 16 in the report of the IPCC Working Group 2 concludes that in part uh, to in, that in part to limited SRM research, there is low confidence in projected benefits or risks to crop yields, economies, human houses, or ecosystems. Large negative impacts are projected from rapid warming from a sudden and sustained termination of SRM in a high CO2 emission scenario and indicates that co-evolution of SRM governance and research provides a chance for responsibly developing SRM technologies with broader public participation and political legitimacy guarding against potential risks and harms relevant across a range of scenarios. Several possible institutional arrangements have been considered for SRM governance under the United Nations Framework Convention or the United Nations Convention of Biological Diversity. Regions, reason, reasons for states to join an international governance framework for SRM include the prevention of unilateral action by others and benefiting from research. Alongside the UNFCCC through the subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice, the SUBSTA, also the WMO, UNESCO, and UN environment could play a role in governance of SRM. Each of these organizations have has relevance with respect to the, to the regulatory framework. And finally, an equitable institutional or governance arrangement ar around SRM would have to reflect the views of different countries and be multilateral because of the risk of termination and risks that implementation or unilateral action by one country or organization producing negative precipitation or extreme events has effects across borders. 
So is this, uh, Elia, I, I uh, summed up, I guess, on the points that uh, Kai have already brought in, and I'm absolutely sure that the next presentations will provide some specific regional examples of, uh, of the potential risks of SRM. So thank you very much for the opportunity again. Thank you, Thelma. Um, we are now moving uh, to a pre-recorded presentation by Matthias Honegger. Um, he was unable to be with us for the full length of the event, but he will be joining us for the Q&A portion. So please formulate your questions if you have any. Uh, his presentation is focused on the implications of SRM for the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. And a quick uh, introduction to Matthias. He's a, a Senior Climate Research Associate with Perspective Climate Research. His expertise is in climate policy, UNFCCC negotiations, and governance of geoengineering. He researches the diverging views on solar radiation modification and carbon dioxide removal among policy, uh, climate policy negotiators and observers, and the tensions between popular expectations, economic models, and policy planning. He has authored numerous articles, commentaries, and reports on policy design for carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation modification, and led the first assessment of their potential effects on the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goal. So give me just one second to launch his presentation. Good morning, everyone. And uh, it is a pleasure uh, to be speaking to you today a little bit about why uh, thinking about the SDGs and, and SRM in the context of overshooting climate uh, temperature targets might be important and to share some uh, insights from a uh, previous study um, where we explored uh, interactions between SDGs and SRM, potential SRM deployment, um, and yeah, give you some insight into that study. Um, it's clear, you know, when we think about SRM, you know, we think about the future and we have different assumptions how this could play out, but there are at least three pathways through which uh, SRM could be impacting on the SDGs, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, as a major uh, orientation point or a guidance for how we collectively envisage you know, a beneficial future for everyone on this planet. And so those impact pathways, they go through, you know, on the one hand, through the physics, um, you know, where climate overshoot really accentuates the worries that we have about climate impacts, which really affect all of the 17 SDGs quite majorly, um, as far as we can tell. And the, the evidence out there is quite clear on that, as you've uh, probably heard also from, from the IPCC and you know our expectation of overshooting based also on reports by uh, UNEP, for example. Uh, it is clear that we have there a very big concern of physical impacts through climate change on the sustainable development goals as such. And on the other hand, there's two additional pathways through which imagined SRM would be expected to impact on SDGs. And that's through, well, their um, modulation of climate impacts on the one hand, so both uh, potentially drastically reducing climate impacts and potentially altering them in other ways as well. And then the physical uh, and, and political and economic side effects uh, or social side effects from doing SRM uh, onto the broader landscape of SDG and, and global governance efforts. Um, so those three impact pathways are really, if we boil it down in a very simplistic way, the, the climate risk attenuation uh, effect potentially from SRM uh, affecting all SDGs in a major way, then the physical side effects as mentioned and the non-physical implications. And all of those are cutting across in, in potentially hard to anticipate ways. Uh, and so it's important to explore them with a broad lens and in an integrative manner across disciplines as well. So diving a bit deeper, you know, what we found in our study uh, a couple of years ago is within the first causal chain, climate effects are altered. And thus basically the major effect is that SDG 13 is really affected uh, through potential SRM use. And so if we are able through some form of SRM to, for example, avoid uh, temperature overshoot as a sort of major indicator uh, this would certainly affect SDG 13 and by extension through the arrows directly and indirectly uh, pretty much almost all other SDGs in one way or another and this is simply by uh, attenuated climate change and the the evidence on the internal linkage between climate and other SDGs is quite clear. Um, on the side effects of physical nature there are some uh, indications that you know directly the uh, natural environment in the seas and on land uh, could be affected through physical uh, side effects. 
uh, positively and negatively to some extent. Uh, and so generally speaking, there's a strong biophysical influence also on uh, goals such as zero hunger, uh, health, water, energy, and again, the ecosystems. And then there's indirect influence, which, uh, you know, uh, propagates in, in known and sometimes unknown manners between those and, and the uh, less, you know, directly physically affected uh, SDGs. So there are indirect effects that could potentially take place. Uh, but all of that, again, uh, against the backdrop of, uh, you know, considering the very serious risks of climate change across all, uh, especially in case of overshoot. The third uh, causal chain is a of a very uh, well of a very different nature, of course, and that's has to do with the political uh, side of this. You know, doing SRM would not be a merely a act uh, affecting the physical world, but also the political, the economic, and the social world. Um, and so these effects are harder to anticipate, but it's clear that perhaps the strongest effects might be on uh, you know willingness and ability to uh, alleviate poverty. So there could be very strong positive effects as well as potentially uh, challenges. Uh, you know if there's a distraction from the efforts uh, in poverty alleviation, this is a very speculative, but there are some concerns around that. Um, and other effects could also similarly affect political priorities across the board. And uh, also certainly the global nature of SRM could uh, intersect uh, in complex ways with uh, global partnership for, for the goals and institutions and a sort of global cooperation uh, efforts and abilities, uh, both positively and negatively in uh, difficult to anticipate ways. So overall, uh, you can see that there's a very strong uh, expectation of direct and indirect effects across all these 17 SDGs in the three uh, causal impact pathways that I outlined both uh, you know, the, the direct physical ones with intended and unintended effects, as well as the indirect or non-physical ones, uh, which nonetheless affect uh, in important ways, likely uh, the pursuit of the SDG. So both uh, with a very substantial risk attenuation potential, especially considering the risk of overshooting temperature targets, but of course also with significant uh, risk potential, additional risk potential, but of a different nature um, as, as outlined. Uh, so how do, do we actually approach this? We drew on, obviously, on the literature out there, uh, but this literature is often, you know, uh, spread out through the different disciplines, different fields, uh, and often not presented in a cohesive manner. And on the other hand, we, we have this, uh, you know, the wheel of the 17 SDGs, which represents really the diversity of social objectives uh, on a global scale. And we try to bring both together through a transdisciplinary review. And you can see the the article that came from that. Uh, there's also a, a brief version on C2G's website because C2G uh, gracefully supported our work in this. Um, so you can get the short version of this uh, on C2G's website. And we, we, we did this by drawing on the expertise of diverse uh, global experts in uh, relevance to the SDGs uh, in the different seven, the 17 different dimensions thereof, uh, as well as, uh, you know, experts uh, in, in SRM, both the physical and the social and political side of SRM. So to give you a bit more concrete examples, um, and you can again find the full list of potential implications in the supplementary materials. Um, basically, for, for example, for SDG 1, for uh, the goal of ending poverty in all its forms everywhere, um, we, thought, we found, especially in regards to the first causal chain, that, you know, ending poverty in all its forms everywhere is really under pressure. If we are overshooting uh, temperature targets, I think, you know, uh, someone said a, a few years ago that overshooting 1.5 or even meeting, uh, limiting warming to 1.5 would, uh, you know, almost threaten the well-being of the African continent as such. Um, you know, this might be a stark statement, but this is, uh, you know, there are very serious concerns about uh, especially exceeding 1.5 and, and even worse when, when we have to look at potentially exceeding two degrees of warming by the end of the century. So if SRM were to work as intended, uh, any attenuation of climate impacts would very seriously enhance the outlook for uh, SDG 1 in this very direct manner. Now, of course, there would potentially be, uh, through the second causal chain, through uh, side effects of physical nature, uh, there could also be uh, adverse outcomes if SRM were to be designed in a manner that does not actually advance uh, the situation of uh, the world's poorest. 
uh, and their concerns about participation. Um, if you know the the world's poorest, as they tend to be disadvantaged in uh, in uh, deliberation processes, they could be further uh, disadvantaged through potential secondary or otherwise negative effects. Um, and that the same concern, of course, counts not just for physical effects but also for uh, social and political effects. If, for example, SRM deployment were to distract from uh, SDG one and the efforts uh, to pursue this, um, SDG seventeen is a particular one in so far that it really is an enabler for all the other SDGs. And so I think especially here, the discussion is around the socioeconomic and political and cultural effects that could flow from SRM use. Um, and this is a very difficult to explore. I think a very um, hard to anticipate um, potential for, for effects. Uh, whereas, you know, on the one hand, the necessary coordination, and I'm starting here with the second point, necessary coordination of doing SRM in a globally concerted manner could enhance global cooperation and uh, result in strengthened processes, uh, including uh, with regard to ensuring the participation of, uh, well, stakeholders, which we all are across the world. Um, so this could also be uh, an opportunity. And at the same time, there are very uh, relevant concerns that, you know, if SRM is pursued in a less coordinated manner, and thus, you know, the topic of today's panel is around governance as well, uh, without good governance, on, including on a global level, um, that builds the trust and collaboration abilities on a global scale, uh, you know, SRM could potentially pose a challenge to uh, partnership for the goals and, and generally the, the means of implementation for uh, reaching the SDGs and similar goals that might flow from them in the future beyond 2030. Um, so this, uh, these reflections draw primarily on the first publication here. Uh, like I said, you can find the, the full list of potential implications um, as an annex to this publication online. Um, if these hyperlinks are made available, you can just uh, click right on, on them and, and reach the, the publications. There's also in the IRGC report uh, to which I contributed a chapter on risk trade-offs. Uh, there's also discussion on certain aspects uh, you know, relevant here, especially with regard to the risk of seeing unilateral or otherwise dangerous uh, use of SRM, uh, which is accentuated, of course, once climate impact pressures are rising, which they are expected to do, especially if we overshoot uh, 1.5 degrees. Um, and so there's a bit of a dual nature here uh, if we think about SRM uh, posing a potential threat, um, but at the same time, perhaps offering a very significant opportunity for limiting risks uh, off overshoot uh, as SRM can potentially be used to slow or perhaps even temporarily halt uh, the increase of global average temperatures. And so the third publication here by my colleague Axel Michalova um, talks about the rising threat of unilateral SRM use um, and uh, again a threat which is accentuated should we see warming exceed um, levels where individual countries or regions start to consider SRM as their only option at a certain stage. Uh, this is certainly a concern and for certainly for me personally, a very big reason why we cannot ignore the governance of SRM uh, and need to engage proactively on this topic. So with that, uh, I, I close my presentation. I look forward to actually be joining you in person during the Q&A. Thank you. So that was for Matthias Honegger's uh, presentation. We'll now give the floor to Asima Kamal Mauni, uh, who is our youth representative um, from Bangladesh. And she's an engaged youth actor advocating for environmental governance. She holds a bachelor degree in environmental science and management and has actively participated in high level panel discussions on climate action. Uh, she has worked as a research assistant and was an intern until very recently at the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh, where she continued to develop her expertise in the field. And she's particularly interested in this um, issue of governance of solar radiation um, modification. So I will now give the floor to you, Asima. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alia, for the introduction. And it is my pleasure to be able to speak in today's event. Uh, I'll be talking about the need for youth involvement uh, in the governance discussions of solar radiation modifications. So we are facing a climate crisis and that is in and of itself intergenerational. The decisions we make today will directly impact the future of the next generations. 
So while we're talking about these emerging technologies, uh, such as solar radiation modification, it is crucial that young people's voices are heard and they actively participate in the decision-making process. Uh, because they're the closest link to the generations yet to come and will be responsible in ensuring a decent livelihood for them. Uh, therefore, we need to uh, provide young people with proper training and access to information to be able to include them in uh, a relevant, legitimate, and in a non-tokenistic way in the governance discussions of around solar radiation modification. Uh, we also need to popularize this science among youth uh, so that uh, we can build uh, their awareness and uh, understanding uh, about solar radiation modification and the dire need for its effective governance. Uh, the sooner young people understand uh, SRM, uh, the better prepared they will be to take positions at the decision-making tables and uh, that which would, uh, which is, actually going to determine their future. Uh, so we can uh, consider them as a full-blown actors in the governance of solar radiation modification. And through this, we will be able to foster a sense of ownership and responsibility for this technology, which would uh, lead to a more informed and engaged public. Uh, so I am going to talk about some policy recommendations that I, along with my colleagues, have uh, published on this STI forum. Uh, the science policy brief, uh, which was entitled as Solar Radiation Modification and Youth Perspectives on its Governance. So we mentioned four uh, policy recommendations, which was informing, consulting, collaborating, including uh, all of which involved uh, youth engagement. Uh, informing, uh, through informing, uh, we uh, made the point that it is crucial to provide young people with accurate and up-to-date information about solar radiation modification, about its benefits, its risks, uh, the risk-risk analysis through mainstreaming uh, climate change science in the curriculums at an early stage. Uh, social sciences should also be connected to solar radiation modification discussions uh, because it is uh, through the social science, we will be able to address the ethical uh, and political questions, which is very uh, important uh, for its governance. And consulting, through consulting, young people's ideas and opinions uh, on solar radiation modification governance can be collected through surveys and public meetings. Uh, collaborating, we can uh, empower young people to build their capacity, establish networks, partnerships, create youth-led programs at local, national, and international levels to facilitate dialogue and collaboration between youth organizations, academia, government, and industry, and all the different stakeholders that is, um, that is related with solar radiation modification, including we would be providing, uh, we could also provide concrete spaces for young people to participate directly in policymaking, training and resources for advocacy, research, innovation activities and policymaking. Uh, it is very essential to recruit young and early career individuals as policy advisors, scientists and public and diplomatic services to ensure that their active participation in the development and discussion decision making process of this governance around these governance um, discussions of solar radiation modification is being considered. Um, actions of specific importance uh, could, could include providing training and resources for young people to become involved in advocacy and in research and innovation, activi innovation activities, um, but also creating opportunities for the youth to actively participate in policymaking. As a governance frameworks for solar radiation modification are still to be designed, which is very important, uh, fostering meaningful youth eng engagement from the beginning is an opportunity that should not be missed if we are to ensure that those processes will be inclusive and future-proof. Um, so as an environmental science and management student, uh, um, I realized two important things during my earlier years of studies. Uh, firstly, um, uh, wherever I looked, I saw a problem and I felt like I'm responsible for those. So I felt overwhelmed by the multitude of environmental issues. I understood its complexity at the very beginning and uh, um, like littering, plastic pollution, water scarcity, air pollution, food wastage and so on. Um, yeah, <laughs> everything left me so hopeless. And also, secondly, uh, what I realized is that everyone has a say about environmental science or climate change, uh, as every human on Earth is a stakeholder of this environment of our climate. And um, uh, I also realized that when 7 billion people or like when 
this, a lot of amount of people will have a say about one thing. It would never be possible to bring a hundred percent agreement around one issue, specifically when one's comfort and lifestyle are so closely related to the emergence of a problem. Uh, so while currently now, while studying a solar radiation modification and the need for uh, strengthening its governance, uh, it has become apparent that like climate change, SRM will always have proponents and opponents. Therefore, um, in order to establish a consensus on whether or not SRM can be utilized as a supplementary measure to address overshoot, we need a transparent, inclusive, and effective governance, which is very important. And uh, with saying that, uh, there is no single solution or no silver bullet solution that through which we would be able to address the climate, the complex issue of climate change. And we must look at multiple multiple solution to combat this problem. Um, uh, I also found one of this interesting thing that uh, it is worth noting, uh, which is in the past, uh, we humans interfered with the climate system through industrialization and other activities, um, often without fully comprehending the natural process that is involved. So discussions about human-induced climate change started years after industrialization revolution, uh, um, which is common. And also interestingly, even before the realization uh, that climate change is a natural phenomena. So we started talking about human-induced climate change even before realizing that uh, climate change is a natural phenomenon and that has occurred throughout the Earth's history, like uh, surviving us through the past, the Ice Age. Uh, this happened as we were less informed. We were not informed about what the the people were not informed about what the consequences of deploying new technologies could be. We did not have any governance mechanism for technologies that we invented and deployed, and we are still quite running that way. Um, so, however, we cannot afford to repeat these same mistakes, and it is crucial to establish robust governance mechanism for technologies like solar radiation modifications, what is uh, emerging technology and what we are talking about now. It is very important to establish robust governance mechanism and uh, through which we would be able to avoid potential negative impacts on the environment um, and society. Uh, we need to conduct a thorough risk risk analysis of SRM develop transparent, accountable, inclusive governance frameworks and ensure that all stakeholders are included in the decision-making process. Um, uh, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, we should work together to ensure that discussions on the governance of SRM are conducted in a transparent, accountable, and inclusive way um, so that through which we can pave uh, the way for a sustainable and equitable future for the generations to come. Thank you. Over to you, Alia. Thank you so much, Asima. Thanks for sharing your perspectives. Very insightful. Um, I Before we give the floor to Dr. Chris Leonard, I would just like to remind everybody that you can formulate your questions in the Q&A box uh, as they come to you, and we'll be addressing them in just a moment. Um, so a quick introduction of Dr. Chris Leonard. He's a climate scientist and a clim uh, at the Climate System Analysis Group of the University of Cape Town, whose research interests include uh, regional climate information, regional climate modeling, renewable energy, understanding extreme climate events, and building African climate scientist capacity in climate research. He is involved in several projects, including the Wind Atlas for South Africa, Health Radar, the Degrees Modeling Fund, and Focus Africa. He has authored or co-authored over 60 academic publications and five book chapters, including uh, as lead author of the IPCC Special Report on Land and Climate, and serves on various committees within the World Climate Research Program. Chris, it's a pleasure to have you. The floor is yours. Cool. <clears throat> Thanks so much. And Asima, thank you for your talk. I'll hopefully reflect a little bit of what you said in my presentation also. So let me start by sharing the screen and firing up the presentation. Just so that no one's confused, I'm I'm not a young scientist by any stretch of the imagination. If you can see my beard, there's a lot of gray coming out there. I am being asked to talk to you largely about how do we build capacity to do SRM type research in the global south. <clears throat> um, and that's what I'm going to try and do uh, in the next hopefully less than 10 minutes. So let's dive straight in, assuming, there we go. The reason for developing capacity to do research in the Global South is largely because uh, the Global South is the most vulnerable, has the most vulnerable communities um, to climate variability and climate change. 
and by inference then also to any kind of SRM or, uh, efforts that may take place. There's this band of very high vulnerability, vulnerably vulnerable communities in the tropics and in the subtropics, and then Africa stands out um, really obviously as probably the most vulnerable place in the world when it comes to climate variability and climate change. Um, that vulnerability contributes to risk. So um, risk is defined by the IPCC in this image is a function of vulnerability, the climate hazard and the type of exposure that any community um, has towards uh, the hazard. And this creates risk and risk is emergent and risks can be key risks. And they, this all creates an impact. So depending on how uh, at risk you are of a particular event that will have impacts and so it will affect your lifestyle. We tried to add, this is called the risk propeller. We tried to add in this latest IPCC process, another blade um, to the propeller that took into the account any response. So if you are at risk, you want to try and adapt to that risk or do something about it to alleviate the risk perhaps. And that response may um, lessen your risk, but if you're doing something wrong that you're not aware of, it may also increase your risk. And this is also where SRM fits in. <clears throat> so we want to understand what are the risks that we might be facing um, if we eventually, God forbid, um, have to seriously think about SRM. Um, so we want to understand risk in this more holistic kind of context where we're looking at exposure to climate hazard, assessing what our vulnerabilities are, <clears throat> what the impact might be, but then also how does our risk change if we respond to that risk and in our context it's an SRM. Um, type of context. Africa is where I live, it's what I know. I am reluctant to speak <laughs> to other places, but future risks in Africa are higher, as was alluded to in, in an earlier talk. We're at at 1.5 degrees global warming. So again, 1.5 degrees is this nebulous political term. What does it mean at the regional scale? So if the globe is at 1.5, what happens at the regional scale? And for me, at an African scale. Um, we, in our IPCC report, we assessed that, uh, this is chapter nine of working group two, we assessed that there are large regional crop losses. Um, poverty and equality um, increases quite dramatically. This is also mentioned earlier. There's increased exposure to various diseases as the disease vectors expand their, um, <clears throat> their habitats, increasing drought and increasing heat mortality. Um, and there's a very big red blob uh, in West Africa about that. What happens if we go above 1.5 degrees, which as Thelma um, showed us is extremely likely going to happen. The risk becomes very, very high um, to us in that now instead of just having regional crop uh, loss or, or yield losses, that becomes extremely widespread over many, many regions. Seven to 18 percent of African species are at risk of extinction. And um, you, know, you all know Africa's <laughs> place for animals. Uh, you come and spend money here, which is when we enjoy that. Really importantly, um, an over 30% decline in fisheries is what we assessed. And for many lake and sea communities, fisheries is their lifestyle, it's their livelihood. And if this decline occurs, they lose their livelihood. Um, and again, that's a really, really high risk. Widespread heat related mortality risk. And then this all comes together for severe risks of malnutrition because it impacts the entire food system. So this is what we're facing. This is the risk that we have a look at. The UNEP report that was mentioned earlier has a short quote from it, is that SRM is the only option to cool the planet within years. Um, and this, this is not what they say, this is what I'm suggesting, is that this might reduce some of the risks that, I've, uh, that you can see above there. If we are able to cool the planet um, by some half a degree or degrees or some measure. However, SRM does carry with it its own risk. And this is, again, where Thelma was talking about the risk-risk framing, um, that we always need to think this through. What is the risk from greenhouse gas emissions and, and global warming? What is the risk then posed by SRM? And we need to continually keep this um, mindset, this risk-risk framing mindset. So <clears throat> we have to do research to understand what how these risks may change. So if, we, if we're going to warm to 2.5 degrees or 2.7 degrees, we decide SRM is the way to go. And what does that mean for us, for me in Southern Africa, really? 
in order to get to increase and enhance our understanding, we need to do research. And we do that research, hopefully, in this decade. This decade, um, in the, the latest um, synthesis report, has been called the decade of action. So basically, we have this decade left to try and do something about um, climate change and the impacts of climate change. But we have to do research to understand what that what that might look like. So in Africa, what does the funding research landscape look like? Here's a graph that we've taken that we put in our chapter. The blue curve is global funding for climate research since 1990, and it's it's nice. That yellow one that barely leaves the zero line that's the money that was directed towards Africa for climate research over Africa. And if you do the sums, you get to only 3.8% of global climate research funding was spent on Africa since 1990. And given the most vulnerable context that we sit in, um, that's not great. It gets a little bit worse because if you try and figure out where that money went to, um, it basically goes back to the funders. So if you're American doing research on Africa, the money stays with you. It doesn't actually go to African researchers. It goes back to whoever funded it. And most of the funding originated in the US and the UK and the EU, and it went back there. So less than 1% of funding for climate research over Africa since 1990 actually went to African scientists. And this is not the funding that you're looking for. If you know what the date is today, that will mean something to you. But this, there's a, there's a really, um, this is a really big problem because if the question is how do we create researchers within the global south to think about um, SRM research and what it might mean, it does require funding that can actually let us do that because at the moment we can't. So this funding model is not what you're looking for. Um, what we are part of, or what I'm part of, is the opposite of what I've just shown you. And this is a, the Degrees Initiative. It's called the DMF Fund. And largely what this group is doing is that they're trying to let us, as developing nation scientists, do our own research into SRM. So putting developing countries at the center of SRM conversation. Um, Pre-2018, this is where SRM research is being done. And you can see it's largely in the global north, perhaps except for, for India and China. When the Degrees Initiative came along, they got a bit of money and they were able to bring in some more countries from the global south to do SRM research. And in 2023, um, they got a bit more money and were able to empower some more uh, scientists in some more countries to do SRM research. So you can see within the space of about five years, just because there's funding, and it's not big funding, it's, it's, it's a small bit of funding, but it's actually empowering us as Southern researchers to move into this space and to actually get create a voice. Um, 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 Asima was talking about the youth voice. Um, this is kind of like that in that it's the Southern voice that's becoming uh, more and more uh, louder, I hope, in the community. What have we done? We, we've moved largely in the physical science space and these are the papers that we've written, and they are from all over the world, um, South America, Africa, Asia. And these are often the first papers that have been published on SRM research um, in, the, in the particular regions. So it's been a really big deal. In this, I think there are 12 or 13 papers here. There will be five more coming out this year and even more than that in the next three years um, because those 2023 20, projects have only just come online and they will last three years. So it's really getting into the academics of it. And a small bit of, coming back to this graph, a small bit of funding has gone a long way to increase our understanding of what SRM might do to the climate um, of, of Africa and in Southern nations. But where can we go to from here? And this is where our current thinking is. Could we develop something like a Southern Research Center of Excellence for SRM research or a research hub where we can coordinate different types of research into SRM. And here, going back to that understanding of risk where we have hazard vulnerability exposure and response, we want to try and understand, this again is all just in my head at the moment, and a few of us are thinking about this, but understanding regional climate risk in the risk-risk framing. What might this consider? There would likely be some kind of climate science. There would have to be some climate science um, being done in this. When you're looking at atmospheric processes, what does this RM do to the El Nino? That type of thing. Develop scenarios. You'd have to do climate model development um, to 
yeah, to, to understand theoretically what might happen and then also downscaling to get information at a regional scale. There would also have to be something like impact science. I imagine we're looking at what are the impacts of this change on hydrology, agriculture, health, or energy. There would need to be a social science component to this where we think about ethics and climate government, um, risk, behavioral change, economics. And what's come out here is perhaps um, other aspects like political science where we start thinking about, so how do we make all of this work if we do eventually get there? So I hope that's been useful and I will hand back to you. I'll stop sharing. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, we've had some very interesting uh, presentations and I'm sure the discussion that will follow in the Q&A portion will be just as interesting. I'll now give the floor back to Kai who will be uh, facilitating the Q&A. And I see that we've already uh, gotten a couple of questions in the Q&A box uh, and, and some answers in writing. Uh, Kai, I don't know if you want to pick up these questions and uh, address them uh, live or if we should um, See if anybody else has any questions. I'll leave it up to you. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, first, if everyone now can turn on the uh, the video, so um, you know we become like a group uh, all together. That's and maybe turn off your microphone. Um, I have it to switch it off because I may have background noises soon. Anyway, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the um, the the questions which have already appeared in the um, in the uh, you know in the Q and R um, interface. Please continue uh, adding there. Um, they have been answered in writing, so I, I maybe come back to those which have been answered um, later on to make sure that everyone is is, is becoming aware of that. One was uh, having well, there is one open one. Let me just have a clicker. Of course, um, we have one one question is uh, that uh, you know there are many stakeholders which are skeptical that the UN can move swiftly enough to develop an effective governance mechanism. Would a multi-stakeholder partnership be more effective as private sector governments, civic groups? and multilateral organizations could uh, all have voting rights in setting global norms. Um, if there's anyone who would like to react to that um, kind of question, if it's comfortable in doing so. By your okay, thinking. Kai. Thelma, yes, please. No, yeah, uh, okay, thanks. Uh, no, let us uh, kick off. <laughs> Melt the ice, as we say. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so but the response I'm going to give uh, is not to be uh, confounded with any prescriptiveness from the IPCC. So I'm giving my response on the basis of my own um, my own assessment. So I, 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 I concur, that, you know, that some of um, the suggestions that have been provided, including in the IPCC, as I have um, given in one of my slides, might be uh, might lead to long discussions where uh, we might need to, to take, uh, you know, um, more quick action. I, in this respect, I think that the idea of partnerships is interesting, but uh, obviously we would have to find, uh, you know, identify uh, these partnerships, who would finance these partnerships because without funding to promote or to seed the scientific project, it's going to be a little bit complicated. Uh, I find that, you know, there are some initiatives that are already financing, in particular, you know, some NGOs that are financing some uh, some research on, on, on SRM, but, uh, you know, uh, mostly in isolation and not necessarily as a big partnership where you have different groups of people with different expertises that could really contribute all together for uh, for advancing. Uh, partnerships, I think, that could also be more regionally, you know, put together. And that, that would be a benefit, I would say, instead of having, you know, a framing that would put everyone, every single country in the same basket. So, yeah, that's uh, some, some uh, you know, uh, of the inputs to, to me. I appreciate in the partnerships, the interdisciplinarity, uh, the transdisciplinary approaches that could be provided. And I think that all things could be uh, explored. Yeah. So thanks for the question. And uh, I hope I have uh, helped to respond. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe before I, I have a few questions um, in case we don't get more, so to say, um, uh, coming up. But maybe if anyone of you would like to react to um, the questions which were in the uh, in the Q and A uh, exchange, um, maybe that's now that we have the ice broken and we're beginning to swim in the water. Uh, Matthias, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, perhaps I'd also address uh, Paul Zeitz's question on the UN as as the sort of central uh, decision making point, and whether there might be other uh, contexts in which decisions might be taken more pragmatically or, or uh, inclusively in some ways. I think it's a matter of, you know, dissecting a little bit what types of decisions we are looking at now imminently the main decisions are around you know empowering research to take place and and if research is to take place in what forms and you know what boundary conditions how to shape it in such a way that we avoid you know uh, falling into a trap of either nature you know either um uh, slippery slope towards srm use or uh locking it out entirely from the beginning um so questions around that, I think, are best, in some sense, addressed at a national level. Uh, research funding agencies uh, have a main say in that. But at the same time, they need to learn from their peers in other countries, I think. So um, and, and, you know, the setting up of certain ethics boards, et cetera, to to explore what could be undesired effects of certain types of research, depending on how they're set up. Um, so those are all issues that can be tackled today, in fact, I think, and some countries are starting to go towards those uh, the, those immediate steps to, to figure out what may make sense and what may be risky. Um, and it's, it's a very different type of question compared to what we often have in mind, which is this long-term question, you know, should we do SRM? Uh, and, and who's the we in this question is always challenging to answer as well you know is it a, the international community quote unquote and what does that mean again um so clearly there are some questions that will need to be answered at a global level and whether some un forum will be the best place to do that or not is is you know one can debate um it's it's a matter of really looking closely i think what what do we need answered right now or what steering do we need to have in place right now Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, any reactions on that from the panel? No, not really. Okay, then uh, you know what? Maybe, maybe uh, Asima, may I, I can I can inject a question to you? Is that um, how how would young people and and youth led organizations be better included in discussions around SRM? What what do you see like uh, key key factors in that um, uh, to 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 place? You heard that there are these proposals of these various modalities of partnerships, research activities, et cetera. Maybe you have some, some ideas to share there. Yeah, thank you, Kai, for the question. So uh, to engaging youth and like youth-led organizations to be better included, uh, as I've also mentioned while I was talking, uh, we can empower youth voices uh, by providing uh, the youth-led organizations to engage in meaningful and informed discussions uh, we need to educate and build awareness among young people. Um, we can do this through educational programs, workshops, seminars, which is focused on SRM and the need and specifically um, strength, um, giving importance to the need for the strengthening of its governance and um, collaboration between uh, youth-led organizations and uh, SRM governance stakeholders can also uh, lead to more informed and engaged public in inclusive decision-making. Uh, so all in all, uh, there is a need for uh, transparency and accountability while uh, all of this is happening in the governance of SRM. And um, um, so, and the young people and youth-led organizations need to have the proper access to information and be involved uh, in, uh, in the whole process. Uh, thank you very much, Asima. Now, I, I just keep, uh, choosing the one or the other uh, of our panelists and address a question pending um, open questions which you might have. Um, Chris, um, how do you how, how you think um, capacity building efforts can be scaled 
up to ensure the, that a wide range of stakeholders in the global south are equipped to participate in decision making. Mm -hmm. You pointed and alluded to this in, in your presentation, but maybe you have some some additional thoughts on that. Yeah, um, we we are trying to in the global south come up to speed at a higher rate, I suppose. Then we, we're trying to approach global north um, levels of understanding and competency. So in order to do that, we have to start at the beginning. And I, I think I'm prejudiced because I'm a physical scientist. I, I always go to natural and physical science first. And I think creating a, a competent scientific community to actually explore the, the modeling work that gets done and what the potential futures might look like is, is a starting point because you've got to build on something. You've got to build on a, on a foundation that is relatively realistic. Um, we're all in, we're living in a theoretical world at the moment. We're living in a model world. So interrogate the models and understand properly what the models are telling us. But we've got a decade, I think. It is the decade of action, according to the IPCC. And if we can build that scientific layer, I suppose, uh, within the next five or seven years, then we've done something right. But at the same time, needing to engage in all the different um, spheres that we've have been mentioned here, the governance, the ethics, youth. Um, and these are not my communities. <laughs> so I don't know where to start. And this is, again, creating the Southern network over the next two to four years of, of who needs to be a part of the discussion, I think is, is what we need to actively start to do. And not only people who are like researchers like myself, but also folk who are critical of SRM. And there's a comment there about the, the risk risk framing versus the precautionary principle framing. Um, so engage all of these different um, thoughts in, in the same space to see if we can actually make headway. But it, it, it's, it's going to take a lot of work. It's, and as Thelma also mentioned, it's going to take a lot of funding. Where is the funding going to come from to fund Southern researchers to do this kind of work? Um, it's not going to come from the US. It's not going to come from the EU. Where is it going to come from? Yeah. Very certain points. Um, maybe, maybe um, uh, tell Mark, um, from what are your thoughts around this? I mean, the, we are basically hearing, you know, the kind of work and the kind of size of the chance in, you know, uh, networking the people, bringing them up to speak, interacting them, whether you organize this regional and then, you know, connecting them above, et cetera. Um, and, and, and the lack of funding, how does this relate to the, well, maybe what, what Matthias was saying, to the, to the increasing, potentially increasing situation that um, the impacts will become stronger, the situation become less hopeful, if I may say, and then an, an, a push, a very strong push, most likely by those who have the resources and a limited understanding, um, to 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 use and deploy these uh, these kind of activities, and I, I'm saying this also not in the we, we've all seen this that um, even as small as this this event might be, it's extremely significant that the private sector company basically decided to take action and uh, construct a, a business model um, around around this technique, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks. And so the, so the question is, how do you see this kind of various pressures and tensions? Um, uh, being resolved um, as next steps uh, to which, how can, how do you see that uh, processes you are involved in could potentially contribute um, uh, whether this is the IPCC and others um, uh, to, to, to addressing this challenge um, that one doesn't increasingly be faced in a situation where the, inter govern the international governance does not address um, solar radiation modification as an emerging technology. Uh, okay, Kai, uh, um, I think I'm going to give some scattered answers to your question. Very good. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and obviously, please take my IPCC head out, although Absolutely. I do see the importance of the science, you know, presented by the IPCC because it, you know, it sets the foundations for the discussions. So it doesn't take any prescriptive uh, way or anything, but it puts on the table the reality up to the stage that we are now in terms of scientific understanding. 
And so I think that the IPCC is evolving a lot and we even have a concern not with only this topic, but other topics as well. Because uh, if we look at the, the literature that has been produced on SRM, it's very recent. So it's building up, building up, building up quickly. And IPCC in this last assessment was able to really put much more than it had in the, in the previous assessment. Is still maintaining the concern that we know things and we don't know things. So it is separating. It can be helpful here, but we don't know the implications. We don't know the overall implications, the regional distribution of, uh, of the negative elements that we see from this. So that is, that is one thing. So science is, is, is important. Another aspect Kai, that I say, I have been in the government. There is nothing more concerned when the government comes to you and say, so what? <laughs> now we are saying, you know, some, uh, in some places, research is already going on. Uh, we see some very worrisome deployment in a small scale. But, uh, you know, where is this leading to? And so, and governments, uh, not necessarily, and I really uh, acknowledge all the efforts that C2G has been putting to bring uh, awareness to, to, to governments on these, uh, the previously called geoengineering that now we really set apart as CDM and, uh, and solar radiation management. So. Um, I, I have faced the situations when the government called me and it said, is this really happening? Is this really affecting or is going to affect our, you know, production, crop production? If so, where? <laughs> so we need to be ready to, to respond to the government. And I see the role of the scientists as, as being, you know, in that direction, because the government, you know, many people are just technical people that are there, or people that really do not know it depths all the elements that might be, uh, you know, uh, on their plate. So, uh, but there is one issue that I think that comes is not talking about deployment. I think that, you know, there is a whole room for research that is lacking, and we should not prejudge that these research is going to be followed by deployment. Now, it's just going to pave the way for a more informed discussion in different forums. That is how I see it. So international community have a play on this. I think it does, but not necessarily on the nitty gritty things. But I would say in setting up some principles, some ethical principles. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, so I think there is a role there. But we talked about the partnerships and we are seeing some initiatives uh, like, for instance, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research has done a workshop, you know, a couple of months ago, three months ago, and they came up with, you know, forming a partnership. And obviously, they have the concern, where is the money coming from? And in that aspect, I think that you go stepwise. <laughs> First, you organize yourself. And then you go after money. And I am sure that money will be there. Okay, so uh, also how to really do the capacity building for some, some, in some areas that is lacking. You know, we do have a big gap in modeling and all these, these studies that are being conducted based on modeling. They're based in models, right? So how to downscale those models to be useful regionally. Is that a, a weak stain in an institute that is doing these modeling exercises? It's not, it doesn't help. So we do have to have a strategic vision on a, how to move this. Honestly, I do not think that the fact that we are doing research on this would be an indication but my country might not think about this like I'm saying. Uh, they might see that this is a preparation for or an anticipation for something that is inevitable. And, uh, and so might be a little bit, you know, 
constrained and not really looking forward because we need first to put the ambition on the table, do whatever we, we can in terms of a, a global effort before thinking about this, but this might be too late. This is gonna take 10 years, 15 years of maturity in the research. Research takes time. So if we put all these elements on the table, uh, Kai, uh, I, I think that we need to, 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 to really have, uh, you know, uh, the regional strategies, region, regions thinking of the partnerships they want to do and how to advance. I am not sure if the governments are ready for that. Scientists are, scientists are, because they know that they need to be prepared to respond to something that might come up in 10 years or 15 years. And if we don't start now, how can we help? Uh, thank you, Thelma. Um, and uh, I think it was very helpful because basically there is a dilemma of uh, a need for policymakers to potentially intervene at this stage to set a frame and context, which is not too antiquity, but sets the direction. I think Matthias, you also uh, alluded to this. And I think also some of the comments point to that need, for example, the one of uh, Ms. Ribeiro just now is, is that there is a need to be clear um, that, uh, you know, research uh, doesn't lead directly to the deployment, that it does not provide for an undermining, but uh, at the same time recognizes the situation, at least if one looks at the, at, at, at the, the IPCC conclusions re yeah. you referred to, uh, to, uh, to, to get as ready as one can that when the situation occurs, um, or maybe some people act independently, one has the science and the, the, the knowledge to react to. I mean, what, what you described near us, the finding of the uh, of this unit report, uh, report I referred to, that uh, the information base is not there. It's not enough to say yes and no um, uh, uh, in, in terms of, in terms of you know, whether SRM in the context of an overshoot, obviously, and overshoot means it's also too important, I think, to to clear overshoot, this doesn't mean for IPCC and when one talks about it, that one goes beyond in an unlimited way, the temperature. One is on a pathway which will stabilize at a particular goal level. So it's only in that context that, I mean, uh, I think some of those, but this needs to be explicit. Currently, that's what people you know, well-intended mean, but it's not, there is no, there is no, there is no framework in this world, which is universal and enforceable and strong enough uh, as we have seen as recent with this recent uh, event of that uh, private sector company to to prevent action which one which one doesn't want to to uh, allow for so i think that was very helpful uh, chris you have uh, your hand up please go ahead sure it's up for two reasons the one is to apologize to sylvia for removing her comment i didn't know what i was doing <laughs> so i clicked done and your comment went away the one about um how the IPCC say emissions reduction is what we have to do. No, no researcher in this field would disagree with that statement. We we all recognize that that is what needs to happen, but we are also humans, and we know that we often do the wrong thing. So many of us are pessimistic that our governments are not going to adhere to what the IPCC recommends. Uh, well, it doesn't recommend <laughs> what the IPCC assesses. Um, but and as Thelma was saying. If in 10 years time, this actually becomes real. So in West Africa, it becomes almost unlivable in 2050, it gets so hot. And if we continue with this trajectory, we need to know, we need to be prepared to tell our governments what the potential impacts or effects might be of SRM. So this is why we're doing this. We're not, we're not the engineer or the guys who, at whatever the company is that put up the balloon. There, there are unscrupulous characters in here that do want to make money out of it. Um, but we need to do the research to understand what that might mean. Um, yeah, and yeah, I'm sorry I deleted your comment. <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, Matthias, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would want to build on this and and perhaps you know point out so, some are saying that we do not need SRM, and this is a, a you know a very blanket statement, um, and and what it should really say we never will need SRM, and we're 100 percent certain of this. And I think this is, you know, not something that we can declare today, you know, even if, you know, many of us, I think, would wish to make that statement and would we really wish, you know, this can just go away, we can just ignore this, but we don't have any supporting evidence. And in fact, for this to be a true statement, three things would need to never occur. And the first one is 
that we would be 200% successful in mitigating climate change through the ways in which we have already started. 200% because the NDCs are not sufficient. And this is the discussion about overshoot. The second reason is we do not know really how the climate is responding to elevated levels of greenhouse gases. And that's the climate uncertainty, uh, climate sensitivity uh, that has remained uncertain over the last 20 years. We have to resolve that uncertainty. So it might well be that the climate warms much more than what we on average would sort of expect. And the third one is we don't really know how humans will be able to cope with this warming once we are overshooting. And so there are, you know, there's the possibility that the damage and the suffering and the human toll of overshooting is incomparably worse than what we are thinking it might be. And so those three reasons, unless we can be certain that they will never occur, we cannot rule out SRM at this point. We cannot say that we will be able to use it in a sensible way either, but that's a different thing to declare SRM, you know, unusable forever. So I think that's that's really the key issue here when we talk about risk-risk or precautionary thinking. In my view, and the precautionary principle is quite ambiguous on this, in my view, the precautionary principle could also be suggesting that we need to explore much more seriously the different possibilities out there as you know we've tried to point out with the sdg analysis it really depends on how things play out and how things are approached overall okay thank you very much i need to respond to that, I need to respond to that. Sure. yeah matthias I, I i hope i didn't rule out as i am <laughs> on the very contrary, as a researcher, I say I fully support this because I need to be ready. You know, uh, scientists need to be ready. What I think is difficult is to convince the governments, you know, governments, those that are there, you know, high level thinking, well, if we start talking about these things now, it might give the impression that we are not going to be in a in a position to not need it, right? So we may say, oh, okay, there will be technology there, so let's delay. So that's the problem. I honestly think that governments should seriously think about it, not in terms of deployment on readiness to, to understand the impacts, uh, regional impacts, uh, in all aspects, you know, social, economic, environmental, and uh, and then make a good decision when if it comes, when it comes. But uh, obviously, I didn't rule out the need for SRM. Yeah. Uh, so sorry if I conveyed that uh, that impression. Yeah. No, 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 I, I don't think so, uh, um, uh, Thelma. But I think the, the last conversation and, and Santiago is eager and he, he has to uh, make his the, the concluding remarks. But I think what it what it what it definitely shows is that um, that there will be governance requirement even even in the situation that imagine we conclude in five years SRM is not an option and we are going to face what Chris was describing in terms of the Northwest African situation and other situations. These situations will require governments, governance and government and individual people's action and uh, and reaction. So we are in a situation where we have to think about, and the situation compels to think about whether there is or not some technical help or not. And if not, it will also have consequences which are not, which are not trivial in terms of governance in the broader sense, which is not just government taking action, but you know, me and my neighbor uh, fighting over or not, or enjoying a, a new, a new, a new kind of uh, food uh, because it's now it can grow in my garden now, whatever the positive and negative element is. With these kind of short reflections, over to you, uh, Santiago, and uh, for the concluding remarks of this um, this event. Thank you, Kai. Um, mostly thank you to Telma, Matthias, Azima, and Chris, and uh, well to all the participants and the, the question. Thank you very much. And as, as mentioned in, in, a, in, a, in a reply to, to Celia, this is a conversation we did not want to have uh, here in ECLAC, but the inaction of my health emitters have pushed all of us to have it. We support the precautionary principle, uh, Celia. As Matthias, I, I strongly support what just, just said, Matthias. 
uh, however, the precautionary principle comes when there is uncertainty. And uh, what we are here uh, somehow agreeing is that we want to reduce uncertainty by research. We, uh, obviously, the precautionary principle will be there always. It's uh, for us, it's a, it's a core value, but uh, uncertainties need to be reduced. Uh, so that's, that's the only thing for further the research and understanding of uh, SRM. <clears throat> In this regard, that the EPPC, EPCC says the SRM may be needed, but there are risks and we need to create an adequate understanding of the risk and, and create a proper global governance. Uh, Telma, you mentioned this uh, risk risk scenario uh, that is raising because of our inaction, we have not been capable to to, to do what science uh, scientific evidence told us. And, and yes, governments are, some of them are also uh, thinking that a, a colleague from, from Brazil, uh, Carlos Musi, mentioned uh, when you were talking with the parliamentarians, no, this, this uh, reference to uh, the IPCC are the doctors, you have uh, diagnostic the, the, the earth state and and, and uh, the society uh, challenge, and you have uh, said, well, you're, you're ill, and instead of uh, having the proper regime, we are still uh, asking for the magical pill, and the magical pill, it seems SRM. And we know <laughs> when we, uh, we have a medical situation uh, that endangers, uh, endangers our, our health, that this magical pill usually is not, uh, is, or, or it doesn't exist, or it has huge uh, side effects, and that's the case of SRM. So we need to, to do the, the proper preventive medical uh, uh, treatment, but we are not doing that. So that's the problem. That's the huge problem. And, and uh, Chris, you mentioned we are humans, and we usually, and uh, more usually, make mistakes than take the right decisions. So. Um, Chris, you also mentioned that a very important thing for us in EGLAC, we, we always, for 75 years now, we are celebrating that, uh, our, our anniversary, um, EGLAC has been supporting uh, equity, uh, social inclusion, and risk, climate risk, and SRM risk particularly are, could be hard with the poorest and the most vulnerable communities. And that has a lot of implications. So governments prevent the increasing risk of uncontrolled experimentation. And the Mexican case showed that uh, there are all, already some actors that are taking decisions illegal. And uh, we need to, to get a global uh, governance to be able to influence the decision of some, some individuals, greedy individuals, as also Chris mentioned. So, uh, Mm, there is a growing uh, movement to privatize uh, climate action, and that's also our concern because uh, uh, governments are neglecting their role and they are telling we need the private sector engagement and private sector solutions usually are more able to concentrate further the, the wealth if there is a solution, obviously. The, anyhow, climate impacts will be very distributed, particularly deeper with the poorest, but uh, no one will be able to avoid some of the impacts. So governments in action open the space for this climate, climate action with strong biases on the, on the kind of climate solutions. So we need the climate solutions outcome to be equitable. And Asima, you mentioned that, and we totally agree with that. Some political constituencies are strongly engaged with technological solutions and this magic pill and for legitimation purposes could accelerate the adoption of these kind of solutions by the risk attached. And that was also mentioned. So at some point when the warming is uh, increasing, uh, some governments will push for this kind of solution. So if there is not a government and understanding in place, this risk will, will be much more higher. So research knowledge has a value on itself. Training and access of information, as Asima said, is a basic step, but further specialized R&D should be also 
in place. Let me first just understand what SRN potential solutions entail and test them first. And as Matthias mentioned, there are potential huge institutional and geopolitical consequences. Therefore, we all, the global south, need to prepare for a governance setting process. This is why we neglect think that this preparation requires a coordinated regional approach. In the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, we are trying to, to understand the governments, what they want, and to convene, when it's possible, some, some, some meetings. And that is what Sylvia, you mentioned. Uh, we probably we will post something in the coming months, but also that uh, depends on our governance body, that is uh, the governance of Latin America. There is more appetite from Mexico in particular, but other countries as well. So trust and collaboration <clears throat> would be needed, as Matthias mentioned, and informing, consulting, collaborating, and including, as Asima mentioned as well, uh, is basic for these processes. In this regard, the proposal by Chris uh, is, uh, is appealing. And SRM has a regional and global impacts, and not only in the physical environment, but on social and political aspects as, as well. So we need to support a southern research initiative, as, as you propose, Chris. And uh, from the Latin American side, we will try to, to, to do something like that, but we, we are limited in, 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 in our power reach. So, um, about the UN role, and um, Matthias, you, you, you answered already this question. We think a, a, a SRM will have a global consequences, so the governments in a global space, the UN is, 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 the, is the right space, but it is true that uh, UN processes are, in environmental issues, are uh, decisions are made by consensus, so um, it's, uh, they are very slow. So we need, we welcome other processes that could help build the governance. Definitely, we welcome them. Then it is right to remind that, as Thelma said, climate change brings irreversible impacts, and SRN only solves heat, the heat, the warm part of the global warming. So uh, preparing to SRN as solutions, quoted, do not set aside our responsibility to accelerate and deepen in climate action. And as Sky mentioned, we need to shift from walking to sprinting. We need climate action now, and SRM should not be, uh, is in the menu, but should not be eaten. Thanks. Thank you for wrapping up the event, Santiago, and for addressing all of the issues that we've been discussing. It was a fascinating conversation. As, a, as always, we never have enough time to go into more depth, um, but uh, look forward to a continued conversation. I'd just uh, like to thank you all, um, panelists, speakers, for your participation in this event, for your very insightful presentations, and thank uh, uh, the participants who connected today uh, for their interest and, uh, and, and interesting questions as well. Um, you can find more information on uh, this issue and uh, a bunch of related issues to solar radiation modification uh, governance on our website, www.c2g2.net. And that wraps it up. Sorry, we went a little bit over time. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye.